Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Having discussed the information society issues and illusions by David Lyon, we will now in this lecture discuss reception of modern science in India. I mean when I talk about the reception of modern science in India, I mean the way modern science was received during the colonial period and currently how it is being received, I mean in the context of post colonial India. Modern science when it was implanted in Indian soil, what we generally find that it elicited three responses from Indian intelligence. One is acceptance, secondly rejection and thirdly ambivalence. We will discuss slowly uh, what do they imply. I mean the argument is that I mean which has been established historically that when modern science was introduced in India, there was a section of the Indian intelligentsia which accepted modern science in both hands because they could understand, they could foresee the transformative potential of science and technology in the Indian context. And those who rejected it, there were, there were I mean there were two sections who rejected it. Those who believed only in theology or metaphysics, they also rejected the, uh, the, the way science was introduced, uh, modern science was introduced. But there was another section which again thought I mean though another section who which rejected modern science in India, they also thought that modern science again has been implanted in Indian context in India, in Indian soil as a part of colonial dispensation and alien imposition. As a consequence of which the thought it leads to the third position of ambivalence, which suggests that yes modern science was introduced in India, they could foresee the transformative potential of science and technology in India, but at the same time they were thinking that whether uh, it is another ploy of the British for imperialist expansion, okay. they were ambivalent whether to go ahead with uh, uh, western science or not, modern science okay. like uh, Prafulla Chandra Ray. Hindu chemistry, life and experiences of a Bengali chemist and so on. Okay. There, there are different positions. When we look at uh, the perspectives to study reception of modern science in India, broadly they can be categorized under three perspectives, maybe the colonialist perspective, the orientalist perspective and the nationalist perspective which has been sketched by Jahir Babur, one of the eminent scholars uh, of history of science. But we are taking a nationalist perspective to understand this now. Okay. Be why nationalist perspective not uh, against the backdrop of the current debates on nationalism, rather nationalism as a part of anti-colonial struggles. Okay. During Colon, uh, during the colonial period in Indian context. Okay. In this context, we are going to discuss reception of modern science in India. Okay. The, the, I mean and, and as, a, as, an, as a student of STS, I must start with 
the fundamental tension of science and technology studies or the or in short the, uh, the fundamental tension of science studies as I see it okay, is the dialectic between science for its own sake and the production of scientific knowledge that has an immediate utilitarian values affecting the world views, values, meanings, uh, uh, interests, um, attitudes and the corresponding actions of the scientific community which one can empirically observe. I am going to discuss reception of modern science in India by looking at a paper which I wrote uh, may be almost uh, more than a decade ago, uh, which was published in current science in 2006. Okay. Uh, how modern science was received and how modern science was democratized in Indian context by building scientific institutions in India. Okay. And sociology of science and technology as a specialty okay, uh, has been concerned in exploring the dialectic between science for its own sake and science which has got applicational aspects. Okay. Sociology of science as you know is a specialty uh, that examines how and to what extent, in what way and to what extent various socio-cultural uh, factors both internal as well as external to the worlds of science uh, influence the production of scientific knowledge and its application. The literature suggests that the earlier conception that uh, uh, science is autonomous having its uh, internal uh, having its own dynamics having its internal dynamics unconnected with the external world uh, external forces is no longer sustainable today. Rather what we see is that both science and technology uh, as important forces of production okay, uh, have been influenced by uh, various factors ranging from social, economic, political, cultural, uh, legal, ethical, institutional, ideological and so on. That is why the divide between the internal and external worlds of science is not rigid but porous that is what we have already discussed. That is why we discussed how Bloor suggested that all knowledge including scientific knowledge is socially cost. Okay. Uh, uh, that is why uh, even Restivo, uh, Saul Restivo and Wenda K. Bospies uh, pointed out that the social is not only in the external social uh, and cultural milieu or context of science, but in the social organization of science. Uh, uh, I mean indeed in scientists themselves. Okay. The social, what we say social is historically and democratically constituted and hence varies over time and across space. Okay. Then, then what we do, then, uh, then when we say the process of democratization of scientific knowledge in the Indian context, okay, what does that term mean? The term democratization refers to the wage uh, in which democratic is norms, institutions and practices evolve and are disseminated both within and across national and cultural boundaries. Okay. What are the constituents of, what are the, uh, what, uh, I mean when we talk about democratic norms, the process of democratization, what are, what may be the possible factors of this? Okay. One may say equality of opportunities to practice science, to do science, the degree of access to science, equality of opportunities to evaluate any knowledge form, the degree of access to scientific knowledge for application, they may constitute democratic norms, both internal as well as external to the worlds of science. Okay. But, but add on to this, it is important to understand the freedom to dissent constitutes the uh, perhaps the most important democratic norm along with the other democratic norms that we have 
just now discussed equality of opportunities to do science, the degree of access to do science, equality of opportunities to evaluate any knowledge form, the degree of access to scientific knowledge for application and uh, that is why it is important to understand freedom to dissent uh, as, as constitutive of the process of democratization. In this context, in this context, it is, it is uh, there has there has been a relationship between the social responsibility in science on the one hand and the mainstream of political and social debate and action on the other. The concept, what is that social responsibility in science then? Okay. So this, the concept social responsibility in science came into the literature on sociology of science in the context of the second world war. Okay. Historians and sociologists of science use this term, use this term social responsibility in science, both in the context of war and ethics. In particular, we must begin to see the central place of the institutional and ideological role of science in maintaining and or transforming the most basic features of our democratic society. Okay. However, democracy cannot be figured out on its uh, figured out simply on its own terms in terms of either its argument or its vision howsoever important this this might be democracy seeks to connect okay democracy as a value system democracy as a as a constitutional mandate at least in in in, in indian context okay democracy seeks to connect the universe of values with the realm of power and it is essential to see what is involved in this. It may also be useful to try to place this problem of connecting one with the other in its modern setting. Once we have begun to see all of us must decide what if anything see or he is going to do about maintaining, reforming or transforming the present order of society starting with the institutional mechanisms in which see or he is most directly involved. Maybe in the case of laboratories, in the case of departments, colleges, communities and so on. And, and this lecture, our attempt is to provoke a debate and action on these questions. Keeping in, keeping in mind the, the, the context of the building and growth of scientific institutions and universities in 19th century India. Okay? The perspective that we are going to use that is the sociology of science and technology perspective uh, which takes cue from historical sociology. Uh, 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 if, if somebody wants to understand historical sociology, please read uh, the sociological imagination by C. Wright Mills. You can, you can uh, look at the works of Philip Abrams, uh, look at the works of Anthony Giddens and so on. Okay. What, what here we want to do okay, that, that, uh, that how there was, there was uh, a rapid accumulation of knowledge which has characterized the development of science since the 17th century had never occurred before that time in India. Okay. Uh, the new kind of scientific activity emerged only in a few countries of western Europe and it was restricted to that small area of about 200 years. Since the 19th century, scientific knowledge has been getting institutionalized by the rest of the world and India is, was no exception to this. It has occurred through the diffusion of the patterns of scientific activity and scientific roles from western Europe to other parts of the world. When you, when we look at building scientific institutions, I mean institutionalization of modern science in colonial India, the institutionalization of modern or western science in India began with the development or establishment of the great surveys, like the geological, the botanical and the trigonometric under the inspired impetus of the Asiatic Society of Bengal inaugurated in 1784. 
Okay. This was followed by the establishment of uh, universities in the port towns of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras in 1857. This period also saw the consolidation of British rule in India, especially with the, with the failure of the first Indian War of Independence of 1857. The British rule in our country was primarily based on its improved mode of production. I mean, when I say improved mode of production, I mean improved technology, organizational abilities and so on. Okay. We also, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, it was important for the colonial government to maintain its superiority if it were to uh, continue its rule. Colonization is always inimical to any organized uh, uh, development of creativity uh, amongst the colonized. As India was a large country to be governed, the British realized that it was important to have a cadre of well trained Indians in all areas including science and technology. Therefore, the British set up a small number of universities loosely based on the British pattern in the 19th century. In fact, till 1850, uh, in fact, till 1850, India had only one university five, uh, founded in at Serampur near, near, uh, Serampur, uh, near Calcutta in 1818 by a group called the Dens. It was primarily a theological university. Between 1850 and 1900, five more universities were set up at Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, Allahabad and the erstwhile undivided Punjab intending to cover the entire country. The first two medical colleges were set up at Madras and Calcutta in 1835. The first scientific research organization set up by an Indian, Mahendralal Sarkar, was the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science uh, in, at Calcutta uh, in, uh, in 1876. At the end of the 19th century, India had a total of six science related societies, including the Asiatic Society of Bombay set up in 1804 out of which two were professional societies, namely the Agricultural and Horticultural Society of India in 1820 in Calcutta and the Bombay Natural History Society in 1883. However, we must remember that modern science was not introduced in a vacuum and that some of them like Ayurveda and astronomy were more democratized than perhaps modern science then or now. The colonial government started building scientific uh, uh, organizations, institutions to use the knowledge generated by the institutions for gaining better understanding of the territory, climate, flora and fauna of the colony to administer the colony and perhaps exploit the resources in a more efficient manner. It is against this backdrop that the first generation of nationalist scientists attempted to build scientific uh, institutions and democratic and democratize science okay, uh, without taking any support from the colonial government. Enthusiasm was shown by a section of our elites to embrace modernity. Okay. Modern science may also be construed as an attempt to get closer to the colonial uh, rulers. That is why uh, in the earlier lectures we have discussed collapse of the dreams of modernity in 1970s. I mean, uh, uh, because the way modern modernity was conceptualized for a long time, it was only European modernity. Okay? That alternatives to European modernity, multiple modernities, perhaps, perhaps these were not conceived of uh, theoretically uh, uh, for a long time. But, but there, there was resistance to uh, one only one version of modernity or there is there was resist there were there were different forms of resistance to the modernity okay uh, on the contrary those who were suspicious of things western or modern including modern science uh, cannot be viewed as being opposed to democratization of knowledge or of society at large some of them at least did uh, perceive modern science as a part of colonial dispensation 
and as an alien imposition. It was the policy of the colonial government that did not allow Indian scientists to occupy higher positions though many of them were competent. It, was, it thus hindered the process of democratization of scientific knowledge in India and it is in this and it was against this backdrop that the nationalist scientists attempted to build scientific institutions to democratize. Most of the research about uh, perceptions on and reception of modern science in 19th century India focused on the Bengal province and North India initially. However, it does, does not imply that Indian intelligence did not respond to modern science in other regions. For example, the Madras presidency had instruments, but no observatory. The East India Company had established an observatory at Madras uh, in, in 1870. Uh, 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 according to Kocha, uh, uh, it was the first modern public observatory outside Europe and to use today's term the first modern research institute in India. Okay? The, the, the East India Company had declared that the purpose of the Madras observatory okay, uh, was to encourage the advancement of the knowledge of astronomy, geography and navigation in India. There were other more important things than doing science, such as increasing the company's revenue by improving irrigation facilities also. See why port towns uh, were selected to create universities, because it was for the commercial benefit of the British Empire. Okay? Uh, several, several astronomical observations were carried out by uh, Golding Jam and his deputy Warren. Uh, both of which, both of whom were trained astronomers. No. While the British East India Company um, was reluctant to encourage observations in India, uh, uh, I mean observatories in India, okay, uh, the establishment of the Nijamiya Observatory in 1908 in the Hyderabad state shows that the Nijam's regime was receptive and favorable towards. Uh, uh, the establishment and continuation of the astronomical observatory. This was partly because Hyderabad state was never under any colonial regime. Hyderabad was an independent state. right? Uh, nevertheless, democratization of scientific and technological development remained a myth for the millions of the country. Only certain social groups of the society were able to receive and respond to the introduction of modern science and technology to the Indian soil. The, now, the question arises that which social groups, which social groups were the first who received and responded to the introduction of modern science in India. Of course, not much work has been done on the transmission of scientific ideas between different cultures. An attempt has been made to understand as to how knowledge conceived of within the epistemological framework uh, of one culture is received, adapted and observed by another culture. In the first half of the 19th century, uh, in the first half of the 19th century, both Hindus and Muslims had their own elites. However, paradoxically, it was only the Hindu elites drawn naturally from the upper castes, principally the Brahmins, the Vaidyas and the Kayas in the Bengal province who made contact with the British and eagerly sought after modern science which took roots in Europe as a legitimate knowledge. Amongst the Bengali Muslims, there was a much larger socially and economically inferior stratum and a corresponding similar smaller, smaller aristocracy than amongst the Hindus. This fact in itself does not explain the almost complete lack of response of Muslims to English education in 19th century Bengal nor were the explains based on uh, religious outlook for the Muslim response to uh, Muslim uh, for the Muslim response uh, different elsewhere in the country. For instance, between 1876-77 and 1885-86, 51 uh, Muslims and 1338 Hindus took the BA degree in Calcutta. In 1870, only two Muslims both of whom failed, okay, wrote the BA exam, uh, while in the same year 151 Hindus for the examination, uh, sat for the examination for whom 56 received the, their degrees. 
in the north in the, in the northwestern provinces uh, uh, bihar odisha uh, and od although muslims were in a minority the community wise education pattern was quite, quite opposite to that in bengal that's why bengal was much advanced uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 having inclusivity mm, so far as different religious groups are concerned modern scientific ideas and techniques came to india in the wake of the british conquest but they faced three major limitations okay first the scale of implantation and the degree of utilization was limited to suit the policies of the uh, rulers secondly the teaching of science was introduced merely to provide training in various branches rather than creating an appreciation of science as a tool of intellectual and social uh, transformation and thirdly science was introduced in english this is important science was introduced in english not in vernacular languages consequently instead of playing the role modern science played in uh, europe okay it became isolated in indian context it did not interact with different strata of society but leaned heavily for its growth on the government and became an intrinsic part of the policies of the uh, of the rulers yet there was a section of the indian intelligentsia that believed that the british civilization represented a new approach to life and nature and therein led the hope for the future emancipation of india one aspect of this one aspect of this uh, uh, intellectual realization was the thirst of knowledge thirst for knowledge this led to the formation of scientific societies and institutions by indians to provide access to modern science okay mm. and uh, most of the indian intelligentsia okay uh, or the cultural elite felt the need of imparting science education to indians for exploring the new horizons of knowledge um, about nature and life in contrast it it must be noted that when the british introduced western education they did not introduce uh, they did not introduce uh, uh, science in the curriculum rather they focused on literature law grammar and so on okay uh, and in and and later on the teaching of science was introduced merely to provide training in various branches rather than creating an appreciation of science as a tool of intellectual and social transformation okay and and that's why uh, you will find i mean uh, 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 like ramon roy raja ramon roy he was very much critical of this he, uh, that's why he responded uh, uh, to the east india company Uh, uh by writing to them that no science must be uh, introduced modern science must be introduced in the school curriculum itself okay uh, for example in 1875 richard temple the then governor general of bengal wrote a letter to uh, uh, sir john laird mayor lawrence the then viceroy on the rising discontent in india okay okay the the native intellectuals okay uh we quick to note of this fact and of which they were aware throughout the 19th century and even the beginnings of uh, beginning of the 20th century they had they had two options before them the first option was to convince themselves that the best products of modern science were already anticipated by what they considered to be the national philosophy of india namely the vedanta such an effort aimed at internalizing an alien system of knowledge on the one hand and exhibiting rational and empirical uh, significance of the vedantic thought which was treated uh, at best as ethno philosophical by the western philosophical world okay i i repeat it vedanta was treated at best at best uh, uh, ethno philosophical only by the western philosophical world okay it is this concern which has been expressed in the works of vivekananda aurobindo and many others and and the second option 
the second option was to build an, an indigenous tradition of modern science by establishing scientific institutions for pedagogy and research. And this second option is sociologically significant uh, and deserves uh, 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 to be discussed um, by, by reflecting on by reflecting on the building of scientific institutions in 19th century India, namely the, 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 the Hindu college of 1916, Delhi college of 18, uh, sorry, uh, Delhi, uh, Hindu college 1816, Delhi college 1825, the Aligarh scientific society uh, uh, of 1864, the Bihar scientific society in 1868 and the Indian association for the cultivation of science 1876. Okay. Uh, these, these institutions were initiated mostly in the second half of the, of the 19th century as a part of the process of not merely popularizing, uh, but also democratizing scientific knowledge in India by creating opportunities uh, for Indians to pursue science education. Okay. Then let us start with the Hindu college. To, to, to start with, the only people committed to introducing western education in India were, I mean, the, the missionaries, particularly the evangelicals initially, who wanted to use western arts, western philosophy and western religion to rid the Hindus of the moral depravity that according to them was the cause of their degeneracy. These, these attempts did not receive the expected enthusiasm from the Hindu subjects of Great Britain. In, in addition, there was not a way of going about imparting ideas to the latter. The, 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 uh, the, I mean, the Hindu upper castes could not be convinced of almost any of their shortcomings, but they could not be called morally depraved. Attempts by both Orientalists and missionaries received no major of official approval. Consequently, these attempts made little headway. In, in sharp contrast, however, a native gentleman community rose to the occasion and these gentlemen uh, from Bengal were better known as the Bhadralok, the gentleman community, Bhadralok in, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, in Bengal they are known as Bhadralok. Okay. Uh, the, the, they had an inclination towards the acquisition of western ideas in western science through English language in education. Indeed, education itself became the hallmark of Bhadralok status. The, the Simon Commission report observed, uh, I mean the school is one, uh, the school is the one gate to the society of the Bhadralok, I mean school of western education. Within the colonial framework, the conflict among the different systems of knowledge was also a conflict among the value systems. However, for those sections of the Indian society that first seriously took up science as a profession, for example, the Bengali Bhadralok, okay, uh, the, the process of cultural redefinition automatically began. What is that cultural redefinition? Cultural redefinition implies a prerequisite for the legitimation of the new knowledge system. Okay. I mean, I am trying to bank on the works of Dhruv Raina, A. S. Irfanabib, uh, 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 Deepak Kumar, E. Hari Babu, uh, V. V. Krishna and others, uh, uh, even, even J. P. S. Oberoi, uh, uh, J. D. Bernal and others to look at this. Okay. In, in continuation of the reaction to the attempts of both, both orientalists and, and missionaries, the Bhadralok had established the Mahavidyalaya, better known as the Hindu College in Calcutta in 1816. The purpose was to cultivate European literature and European science without any assistance from the government. The, the original cul curriculum comprised not only reading, but also instruction in history, geography, chronology, astronomy, chemistry and other sciences. The college was managed exclusively by the Calcutta Bhadralok. It was open only to 
sons of Hindu families. Please remember it was open only to sons of Hindu families. There lies a sense of caste discrimination and gender bias. Okay? Uh, despite this, its enrollment, despite this, its enrollment, fig, uh, enrollment figures uh, had touched 400 by 1828 and within two decades of the opening of the Hindu college, the demand for English education had led to the creation of a respectable uh, number of English schools originating with the natives and de deriving resources exclusively, exclusively from them. Okay? Uh, this, in this way, the Hindu college was set up and run by the Bhadralok as a scientific institution that would not only introduce the, the application of modern science and technology to the Indians, but also so, uh, but also so them the the uh, the new horizons of life as a whole, um, thus extending the the opportunities to pursue science education and a career in science. But the British were not interested. Uh, please remember, the British were not were not at all interested to introduce science education into uh, the Indian soil as a part of democratization. They opened a Sanskrit college in Calcutta in 1824 to teach Sanskrit rhetoric, sacred literature, law and grammar to Bengali children. However, this was not what encouraged the new elite. I mean elite when I say I mean cultural elite through education, elites through education. Okay? In this regard, the name of Ramon Roy, Raja Ramon Roy uh, figures first. It is clear that the, the colonial government was not inclined to introduce um, uh, science education and inculcate um, uh, uh, scientific temper among the natives, whereas attempts on the part of the native intelligentsia were to promote precisely um, the activities which the colonial government was not interested in. Okay? I mean, no account of India's development uh, uh, to modern times would be complete without a mention of Raja Ramon Roy, an aristocrat from Bengal whose social reforms in the 18th and 19th centuries contributed towards narrowing the gap in attitude towards science and technology uh, among the Indians, a term that is uh, used these days, but which was not used during Ramon's era, though it advocated, though, though he, he particularly advocated uh, it in, uh, in many of his speeches and works is scientific temper. Okay? I mean this, this scientific tip, such, such notion of scientific temper uh, uh, teaches us to sift the, the available evidence objectively and base our actions on a rational approach. Ramon was a rationalist uh, in his advocacy of reason and freedom of thought, his criticism of the existing uh, religion and its rigid practices and caste barriers was inspired by his area, uh, desire to make religion consistent with the changing world of his times. That, that attitude is even more relevant today as the influence of science and technology on our lives is increasing uh, rapidly. Okay? And, and, in, uh, and uh, we all know, I mean, uh, uh, if, you, if you want to read uh, uh, the way he wrote to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, when, the, when the British went on opening science, Sanskrit colleges, uh, Ramon in his all too famous address of the 11th of December 1823 pleaded for the instruction of European sciences. He penned, he wrote like this that as the improvement of the native population, I mean Indian population is the object of the government, it will consequently promote a more liberal and enlightened system of instruction embracing mathematics. Um, uh, natural philosophy, uh, I mean, uh, 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 I mean, enlightened, uh, uh, more rational, more liberal, more uh, enlightened system of instruction embracing mathematics, natural philosophy. Uh, I mean, natural philosophy. I mean, uh, 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 science. Right? Uh, we have discussed earlier. Okay. Only in 19th century, Fuebel uh, coined the term science. We have already discussed this. Okay. Chemistry and anatomy with other useful sciences which may be accomplished with the sum proposed by employing a few gentlemen of talents and learning uh, educated in Europe and providing a college furnished with the necessary books, instruments and, and other apparatuses. And in 1827, 
the Hindu college introduced into its curriculum uh, mechanics, hydrostatics, optics, astronomy, uh, mathematics, um, anatomy and medicine all in English. Then almost half of its 91 students opted to study these though they were not compulsory subjects. In addition, on the whole Hindu students trained in the, in the traditional manner did not have any difficulty in responding to the western coursework. And indeed, the curriculum seems to correspond closely to the Bhadralok ideal of education. It refers to a fusion of, uh, uh, a fusion of the traditional Sanskritic studies of, of rhetoric, uh, uh, sacred literature, law and grammar with those of western literature and science. Okay? When, you, when you look at this, when you, when you look at this, the Bengal province, okay? uh, I mean the, the, uh, in, in Bengal you will find that Hindu college now it is known as the presidency college, I mean presidency university now. Hindu college uh, uh, and, the significant, and the role played by the Hindu college in democratizing science uh, and we must understand this which is even relevant today. Let us now shift our attention to the Beng from Bengal province to the, the northern province, I mean the Delhi college. Okay? Now, it is known as the University of Delhi. Okay? I mean, uh, Delhi college played a significant role uh, in, uh, in the dissemination of modern science. It was originally established as madrasa -i Gajuidin by Nawab Gajuidin Firoz Jung in 1772 was rechristened Delhi College in 1825. Okay? The college was set up to translate scientific books into local languages in general and Urdu in particular. Okay? The, the oriental department of the college carried out studies in modern education through the medium of Urdu in 1835 when the new uh, British policy veered away uh, uh, from the concept of modern education through, uh, uh, through Indian languages, Delhi College took a bold stride in the reverse direction. Okay? Uh, the educational committee was, was created, uh, the educational uh, committee was created uh, to translate into Urdu scientific books then taught in European schools. The English faculty of the college launched the society for the uh, promotion of knowledge in India through the medium of vernaculars, which subsequently came to be known as the Delhi College Vernacular Translation Society and it translated as many as 125 books. These included chiefly Greek classics, Persian works and scientific treatises into Urdu. All these were translated in the space of about 20 years. The society fostered a rich and multifaceted education and transformed Urdu in for, from a language of poetry to the transmitter of Western scientific ideas. Okay? And, and the new emphasis, the, the new emphasis on Western science attracted several young minds and in a short span, Delhi College had produced a few geniuses like Master Ram Chandra. Okay? His work, on different calc uh, his work on differential calculus was published and noticed in Europe. Master Ramchandra was not only an erudite scholar of Delhi College, but also became a prolific teacher at the college. He started a uh, paper in Urdu called the uh, Fawad, uh, Fawad al Najarin, uh, which played an important role in the dissemination of modern science in India. He also edited uh, two more of Delhi's earliest Urdu newspapers, uh, I mean, uh, uh, namely the uh, uh, Mohabe Hind and the Kiranus uh, Sadin, the, the uh, uh, Mohabe uh, Hind uh, aimed at uh, wide readership, whereas um, uh, Kiranus Sadin later published various articles on scientific subjects. Delhi College had a well-defined school curriculum, which included a local language. Onto this were grafted uh, European philosophy and science. Students at Delhi College showed 
clear cut inclination towards a scientific rather than literary education. In Bengal, uh, a sudden uh, literary enthusiasm for the um, newly discovered English novelists and poets swept everything else over it. For, for uh, translations into uh, local languages, some uh, I mean some European teachers like uh, Boutros, uh, uh, a Frenchman, uh, and uh, and uh, and Sprenger, uh, a German, will be remembered for their sense of involvement. Probably, probably this was the reason why learning in English was not, as in Bengal, regarded as vitally important. Indeed. Uh, Delhi College made a laudable and pioneering effort in the dissemination of modern science through the medium of local language. This had an immediate effect uh, uh, of increasing the accessibility to modern science to those who did not have exposure to the English, I mean to, to, uh, to the English language. Okay? Uh, and, and so on. And, uh, the within within northern province you will also find the Aligarh scientific society which is now known as Aligarh muslim university sir Syed ahmed khan okay uh, established uh, the Aligarh scientific society uh, the attempt was in the form of establishment of of this society Aligarh scientific society in 1864 um, it was not only an attempt in importing scientific knowledge but also an effort in the direction of sociocultural change in India. Sir Syed uh, started his career as a clerk with the East India Company in 1838. He qualified three years later as a sub judge and served in the uh, judicial department at various places. Sir Syed Ahmad Khan had a versatile personality and his position uh, in the judicial department left him uh, time to be active in many fields. His career uh, as an author in Urdu started at the at the age of 23 uh, with religious tracts. In 1847, he brought out a noteworthy book, uh, author Ashanadid, I mean monuments of the great on the antiquities of Delhi. Okay? He began by establishing schools at Moradabad in 1858, uh, Ghajipur in 1863. And a more ambitious undertaking was the foundation of the Aligarh Scientific Society in 1864, which published translations of many educational texts and issued a bilingual journal in Urdu and English. The society, the Aligarh Scientific Society, translated around 40 European books dealing with history, political science, geography, meteorology, electricity, algebra, geometry, calculus, hydrology, agriculture, and so on. Okay? It is important. The, the objects of uh, the society were to translate into uh, such languages as may be in common among the people. Uh, secondly, to search for and publish rare and valuable oriental works. No religious work will come under the notice of the society. The this, this society was absolutely secular. Okay? To publish whenever the society thinks it desirable. The, any newspaper, gazette, journal, periodicals, or magazine which may be calculated to improve the native mind, to have delivered in their meetings from time to time lectures on scientific or other useful subjects uh, illustrated when possible by scientific instruments. Okay? From these, these, these objectives, it is clear that the society was highly secular in outlook. It completely eliminated religion from its purview which was something rare during the 19th century. Uh, the, the society also had certain political objectives. Okay? It sought to foster and encourage the growth of an enlightened public spirit. The society also wanted to introduce improved methods of agriculture in India, so that the economic conditions of the people might improve. The activities of the society may be classified into four parts. One, translation of western literature into the into the local Indian languages. Okay? Uh, secondly, practical uh, attempts to popularize and democratize mechanized farming. Thirdly, delivering lectures on topics of common interest. And fourthly, uh, highlighting the socio-political problems of the country. Okay? 
they had they had uh, uh, they had they, I mean it uh, at in during that period they had a library or reading room of its own. The books were mainly donated to to the society by different Indians as well as by by uh, foreigners. Uh, uh, Sir Syed Ahmed Khan himself donated a large number of books to the library. The society subscribed to 44 journals and magazines in 1866. Of those, 18 were in English and the rest in Urdu, Persian, uh, Arabic as well as Sanskrit. Okay? And, and moving from the Aligarh Scientific Society to, to the Bihar Scientific Society, okay? I mean, the B Imda Dali established the Bihar Scientific Society. Okay, to democratize European science in India. Uh, Imda, Imda Dali was not opposed to English education, but he emphasized that uh, the society should not bring in religion into the scope of its inquiry. He was a deputy collector, he had started publishing pamphlets and then a regular journal uh, uh, at, uh, attacking uh, uh, Tehjeeb ul Akhlaq and calling on Muslims to boycott Sir, Sir, uh, Sir uh, Syed Ahmad's reform movement. Imdad was, was of the opinion, I, I mean Imdad Ali was of the uh, opinion that Indian students did not acquire properly the knowledge of Western science and technology when it was uh, taught through uh, the medium of foreign language. Consequently, they failed to transmit adequately their newly acquired scientific knowledge to their countrymen for lack of suitable expressions in the Indian languages. Okay? I, mean, I mean, for the purpose of spreading European scientific knowledge through the Indian languages, Imdad Ali founded an association in, in uh, 1868 at Mujaffarpur called the British Indian Association. Later, the, the uh, I mean the, the letter the uh, name was um, uh, changed to, to the Bihar Scientific Society and the principal aim of the Bihar Scientific Society was diffusion of all kinds of knowledge throughout India. The emphasis was on bringing western arts and sciences within the reach of even the lowest denominations of the society through translations in the local medium of Urdu thus creating equality of opportunities to learn science in a in a st stratified society. The, 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 uh, the, the Bihar Scientific Society suggested to the Senate of the Calcutta University that the st standards prescribed for the university examination be adopted for the vernacular examination uh, uh, and science be taught in Urdu or Hindi. Okay? Uh, they, they, I mean, Science was democratized by translating from different language systems, especially English, uh, to different vernacular uh, uh, languages. Okay? In, 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 in Vic Victorian England, the Royal Institution of London served, the, the, the served as a scientific home for a host of scientists like Davy, Faraday, Tyndall, and Huxley and after Faraday's death, James uh, Dewar. It was a place for uh, uh, visiting scholars who spent short periods as um, thinkers, in it, uh, uh, as workers in its laboratory. The Royal Institution of London was one of the important components of the uh, institutional infrastructure for science in Victorian England. On the other hand, Calcutta had no uh, on the contrary, uh, Calcutta had no such institution during the 19th century. Thus, even while uh, science evoked interest in the capital British of capital of British India, I mean Calcutta, okay, there was not yet an institutional ambience that would induce Indians to practice science, to do science. The reputation and character of the Royal Institution of London and how had however secured the imagination of at least Dr. Mahindra Lal Sarkar, uh, I mean Sarkar was born in the same year 1838 in which Ramon passed away. Okay? He was patently a legatee of the new learning, he studied at Hindu college, later he entered Calcutta Medical College in 1855, 
uh, which has established a formidable course of studies in the sciences, Sarkar truly became the torch bearer of the spread of scientific education after the demise of Ramon. Mahendralal Sarkar was thus a product, I mean he was a product of the, the Hindu college that had borne witness to the event of learning science education. He obtained first a licentiate in medicine and surgery in 1860 and then in 1863 the degree of doctor of medicine, uh, a rare achievement for an Indian at that time. In 1869, Mahendralal Sarkar began broaching the project of a national science association to the public through pamphlets, letters to the editor of the Hindu patriot and public addresses. In 1876, he founded the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, okay. uh, uh, I mean being Sarkar's brainchild, the Indian Association uh, uh, for the Cultivation of Science enjoyed the state patronage, private donations and his own life savings. It was financed from public subscriptions and had the support of Sir Richard Temple, the, left, uh, the then uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Bengal. Okay. Uh, Sarkar, I mean, and and during that period, the Indian, I mean, I mean, uh, Sarkar, uh, during that period, Sarkar felt that the underdevelopment of India was due to its backwardness in science. India had the potential to master modern science. The Indians had shown themselves to master science in the past. In, uh, I mean, the way he wrote we want an institution which will combine the character, the scope and objects of the Royal Institution of London and of, and of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. We want an institution which shall be for the instruction of the, of the masses and we wish that the institution be entirely under native management and control, not British management and control, but the native management and control. Okay? It is very important to understand this. Okay? And, and uh, I mean, he, he desired that uh, uh, Indians, uh, Sarkar, Mahindralal Sarkar desired that uh, Indians should cultivate science not only for economic betterment, but also for their regeneration. Of course, af uh, after persistent efforts, he succeeded in establishing the, the Indian Association for, for the Cultivation of Science in 1876. Later, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science okay, evolved into a world famous research institute. It had a lecture hall by 1884 and a laboratory was constituted uh, in 1891 with donations from the Maharaja Vijayanagaram at that time. It organized a series of lectures by Prafulla Chandra Rai, Jagadish Chandra Bose, Asutosh Mukherjee, um, uh, Pramath Nath Bose, Father Lafant and many other distinguished scientists. It is best known for its sponsorship of the work of C. V. Raman, a physicist who was later awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery named after him the Raman effect. If we, if we critically review, uh, uh, I mean if we uh, have a critical overview of the activities of all these scientific institutions starting from the Hindu college, the Aligarh Scientific Society, the Bihar Scientific Society, the Delhi College, uh, uh, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. If you look at this, only Indian Institute, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science could manage to survive. Okay? This shows how a, how a man of in, uh, unusual drive and determination Sarkar was. The, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science grew from strength to strength and celebrated its centenary in 1976 as the National Institute of Science. Uh, is it remains a uh, monument to the memory of Sarkar who passed away in 1904. The, the, Indian, uh, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science okay, uh, as visualized by Sarkar was an institution for the masses with full audience participation where any lover of science could come and work the way it was felt necessary by the scientist. Being, being a national association created entirely by private donation, the, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science 
did not have any government control, but it met with some resistance. The Hindu orthodoxy thought that the IACS, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science was attacking the Hindu at the traditional Hindu teachings. A large section of the public also felt that uh, this kind of pursuit of abstract science had no meaning for a poor country like India. The cry of the day was utilitarian science, but Mahindralal Sarkar's answer, reply, response was without scientists how can one have science. As, as, you, as I see it, the, the historical, the, 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 the historical survey, then, then in the 20th century you have seen uh, uh, the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai and any, many, many, many uh, CSIR laboratories, uh, many universities came up wh which tried to pursue uh, science education in India. But, but the historical survey indicates that, that uh, democratization of scientific knowledge okay, in terms of access to modern scientific knowledge, creation of equality of opportunities to do science and so on in the colonial period began to occur not because of the colonial government, but in spite of the colonial government. Okay. Intelligence drawn from different religious groups realized the significance of modern science for material and cultural transformation of India uh, and attempted to democratize science in their own way by establishing scientific institutions and using the local or vernacular language as the medium of democratization. Here, I would like to see the building of such scientific institutions by the cultural elite during the colonial period as a part of the process of democratization of scientific knowledge. In post-colonial India, we, which we will discuss through the science, through science, different science policies in India in the lectures to follow, that how, how in post-colonial India the whole responsibility of, of, of democratizing science was by default taken over by the state. It is due to the fact that scientific institutions and societies have partly relegated this inescapable task which they had carried out with enthusiasm and pride okay, during the colonial period as a part of the nationalist struggle against imperialism. Okay. Democratization of science in India is an unfinished task even now. As such, modern science is being critiqued from the point of view of environment, I mean genetic engineering research uh, 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 and human rights activists. Okay. Uh, uh, the process of democratization ought to address these questions. Okay. Uh, uh, democratization may be institutionalized in the process of science policy making, I mean which must be, which should be a broad based democratic, transparent and participatory process. As there is a Chinese saying that, uh, uh, you know, tell me uh, and I will forget so me and I may remember and, and involve me and I will understand. This, this participation, this native participation, local participation is important uh, uh, so far as the question of democratization of scientific knowledge is concerned and to what extent science has been democratized in Indian context can be seen, can be examined. Uh, um, by dwelling upon uh, different science policies in Indian context, okay? starting with the scientific policy, policy resolution of 1958, then we will discuss the technology policy statement of 1983, uh, uh, then we will discuss uh, the science and technology policy of 2003, then we will discuss the science technology uh, and innovation policy of 2013, okay. but before discussing science, technology and innovation policy of 2013, I mean while discussing we will also discuss different aspects of uh, patenting, IPR regime, mm, I mean briefly to make sense of what counts as innovation today. Uh, I mean how developing countries uh, including India have become 
uh, or have uh, or have compliance with uh, the US dictated uh, international patent regime. Okay. In the lectures to follow, we will uh, have detailed discussions on science policies in India. Thank you.